Some of you are like me. There are, are some of the anthems our choir sings that it is just really hard for me to stay seated up here. I just, that was one of my favorites all time. Love it. And what a perfect word for the word that we've been given today from the prophet Isaiah. Arise, your light has come, and we're going to be shining it today. I invite us to enter into the word of God together as we open our hearts to that light. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered in this place this day be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength, our redeemer, and our enlightenment. Amen. The, the first time I met Jesus, he was still just a little baby. I was probably around two or three years old, and it was Christmas time, and my mother and father had set up a nativity scene in our living room, and each night we would gather in front of it, and they would take out each ceramic character, one at a time, a new one every night, and introduce us. This is Mary. She is a mommy, just like your mommy. This is a shepherd. He gets to play with sheep. Bah! We got to know Jesus on Christmas Day. After all the presents had been unwrapped and the Christmas dinner dishes had been washed and Grandma and Grandpa had gone to their home, before I was tucked in bed, we went to the nativity and Mommy and Daddy took out this little, the smallest piece in the whole nativity scene. It was a baby in a manger and they told me that this is what the holiday that we had just celebrated was all about. It was all about him. Jesus was a special child who loved everyone, including me. That's how I was introduced to Jesus. 
How were you introduced to Jesus? My acquaintance with Jesus grew as I grew. I learned that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I learned that Jesus loved all the little children of the world, red, brown, yellow, black, and white. We were all precious in his sight. I learned what a friend I had in Jesus. And not only me, I learned that there was a whole community of people who hung out together and liked to talk about Jesus. In fact, uh, they talked a l- uh, every time I was at this place called church, they talked about Jesus in Sunday school, in worship. And then at church camp, I got to know that everyone will know that I love Jesus, that I'm a Christian. By my love. By my love. They'll know I'm a Christian by my love. And then I learned that Jesus was not just like any other child, but that he grew up into an adult that was different than others around me. Jesus was the Son of God, and God sent Jesus into the world to teach us how to live and love. As a child, Jesus was as real to me as all of you in this room this morning. He was a companion. I felt him with me. And I had conversations with Jesus. Many times they included these words. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, strength, heart, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That was good news, I learned. Something that I could share from our conversation with others, not only in the way I spoke, but in the way I behaved too. Jesus wanted me to share good news with others. I don't remember the moment when I became shy about talking about Jesus. I don't remember when it was that I found it awkward to tell others about my faith when my faith in and love for Jesus became a private thing, a treasure that I kept within me. I don't remember when I wrapped that little baby up and put him away in the attic and brought him out only when I knew that others knew Jesus too. Do you remember when talking about your faith in public became awkward for you? Do you remember when you started to compartmentalize your faith to one day for two hours on Sunday morning? Do you remember when your faith became bound up in polite and protective silence? Somewhere along the way, I became averse to evangelism. And I don't feel like I'm alone in this room. Somewhere along the way, we all became averse to the word and nature of evangelism. The Reverend Martha Grace Reese, in her book, Unbinding the Church, defines evangelism as anything you say or do to help another person grow closer in relationship with God and into Christian community. Let me say that again. And if you would like to scribble it down in a hurry, or you can watch this again on YouTube later. Because this is important. Evangelism is anything you say or do that helps another person move into closer relationship with God and into Christian community. 
It's both and. Now, in those early days, my parents were evangelists. Yes, they were. And then I became an evangelist too. But, but at some point, we started avoiding talking about our faith, except to those who we knew would understand. My friend and colleague, the Reverend Don Darwin Weeks, who currently serves at the Connection Church in Odessa, Texas. Do you know that church, Jane? Is that your former church? No. Okay. All right. Don Darwin Weeks, um, she shares this reflection. Very few of us anymore like to use the word evangelism. It makes us feel either guilty because we're not doing it, or it turns us off because there's no way that we would ever want to do evangelism. The majority of people would rather get a root canal than do evangelism. For the last 40 to 50 years, most churches have been in numerical decline because we have developed a life-threatening aversion to evangelism. Let me say that again as we look around the room today. In the last 40 to 50 years, most churches have been in numerical decline because we have developed a life-threatening aversion to bringing people closer to God and into Christian community. Well, Reverend Weeks contemplates why that is. She confesses her own negative reaction, even as a pastor, to being labeled as an evangelist. She says, I don't want people to think that I have fake eyelashes and big hair and built people out of money. Nor do I want to offend people by pressuring them with rhetoric about where they're going to spend eternity. She then acknowledges what we all probably would find to be true. We do find talking about our faith superficially with each other at church. But when we're, when we're with people who aren't part of the church, words fail us. We flounder. We've lost the art of sharing good news. Of course, there's so many reasons why that's true. Like Reverend Weeks pointed out, the corrupt and greedy tele-evangelists of decades ago have done damage to our faith over the years. The sex scandals of current day faith leaders and all traditions has made us want to step back from associating with congregations affiliated with that type of behavior a growing respect for world religions has caused some of us to move away from claiming Christianity as the only one true way. And, if the truth be known, we don't want to offend or to make social situations feel uncomfortable by bringing up the F word. Faith. Because of that, our faith has become bound up. The prophet Isaiah lived during a time like this when the word of God was not only bound up, but it was shut away in the lives of the people of Israel and Judah. Things were bad. There weren't just rumors of war. There were invasions on the horizon. There was famine and drought and misery abounded. Isaiah reminded his people that they had been given a gift that was not just to be kept in private for themselves, but to share with others in the darkest of times. You heard it read this morning. You heard it sung this morning. Arise, shine, for your true light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness shall be upon the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, 
and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So lift up your eyes and look around you. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons and your daughters will come to you. And then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. What we have to offer the world, friends, is so bright that it should not, cannot, be hid under a bushel. No! We've got to let it shine. If we claim to be Christian, if we claim to love Jesus and know he loves us, then we have a light that needs to shine brightly in the world. We eat so that others can find their way to the thrill of rejoicing. But here's the question. We're out of practice, aren't we? We're out of shape, aren't we? So how do we get started with this? What do we do? What are the ways to get back into faith shape? St. Francis of Assisi coached Christians in an earlier age when he said this, preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. One Halloween, when I was serving my previous congregation, the youth group decided to go trick-or-treating at the local food bank, for the local food bank. We'd go knock on doors, trick-or-treat, and then we'd ask for canned goods for the food bank instead of candy. What a shock that was for the folks who opened their doors. And, and when they donated, and even if they didn't donate, we gave them a thank you card with the name of the church on it and letting them know it was going to the local food bank. The kids didn't really have to say anything except knock on the door and say, we're from Saguaro Christian Church. Trick or treat, do you have food for the food bank? By the end of that evening, we had boxes of items to deliver to the local food bank in the coming days. One of the neighbor families was so intrigued by the fact that a teenage boy had come riding up on a skateboard on Halloween, not to ask for candy for himself, but to help others, that they decided to come give this church a a checkout. So Don and Sharon and their two boys showed up the next week. They'd never gone to church, any of them, in their lives. In fact, Don and Sharon's families of origin had never taken them to church. So they knew nothing. And that was one of the reasons they were hesitant to even walk in the door. They knew nothing about what it meant to be Christian, except that a lot of people acted like they were perfect And they knew they weren't perfect, so they decided they wouldn't ever give it a try. But this time they said, well, let's just go check it out. They told me they'd always been curious about this church thing. And they were curious about a church where teenagers thought about somebody other than themselves on Halloween. And since they had two teenage boys, they wanted to see what all this was. They, they started coming and, and they joined my Bible 101 class. And that's when I learned the truth behind their lack of knowledge. When Sharon raised her hand and asked me where in the Bible she could read about Zeus. Well, you know, Uh, He was a god, right? She had studied about Zeus in her senior English class in high school. What did she know about the Almighty God? No one had ever told her or talked to her about the difference. So over time, Don and Sharon and their boys learned the faith by, by going to classes, 
Sunday school, by listening to church members tell their faith stories about what Jesus meant to them. They witnessed how fun Christian fellowship can be, and also how it's second nature for a faith community to do unto others. It's just second nature. They saw it just coming from people instinctually. So little by little, this family's life changed. They became evangelists themselves, excitedly bringing into the Christian community Sharon's father and mother and sister and her partner, none of whom had ever gone to church before, but who caught the light in Sharon and Don's eyes when they were talking about what they found at church. Now Don and Sharon were good people just in themselves. They were Christian in much of their actions anyway. But what they realized is that they were missing something, that deep connection with all that is in the Spirit. And because of a kid on a skateboard they found their way to getting to know Jesus. So, where do we start? Some of us are too old to be riding around on skateboards right now. Martha Grace Reese, in her first book entitled Unbinding the Gospel, suggests that all of us start with people that we know, with whom we feel safe. Evangelism starts at home with your family and your trusted friends. Remember how Isaiah said it? Lift up your eyes and look around you. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away and your daughters will come on the arms of nursemaids Then you shall see and be radiant. Then you shall see and be radiant. And your heart will thrill and rejoice. For my mom and dad, it was with each of their children that they were evangelists. First and foremost, with us. For Don and for Sharon, it was with their extended families who wanted to know what was bringing out the radiance in them. So, I'd like for us this week to begin our workout, to start getting back in evangelism shape, to start unbinding our faith. I said this in first service, and I just saw panic on faces. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest um, what I'd like for you to do is with the people closest to you that you trust in your life, um, your spouses, your children, your best friends, I'd like for you to sit down, and I'd like for you to share when you first got to know Jesus and what difference it makes that Jesus is in your life. What difference does it mean that you are connected in a relationship with God and with Christian community? How has that made a difference in you? And if you can tell this, if you can speak this, um, what difference has that made with the way that you interact in the world? Now, again, I saw panic on people's faces in the chapel service. I have to talk to my spouse about my faith. I, I get it. I don't, I mean, I, I, one of the faces I saw panic on was Dawn's, my husband's. So, so what, what I'd like to suggest, if that feels a little intimidating at first, then do what I did with writing this sermon. I, had, I asked myself those same questions. When did I first get to know Jesus? And I wrote it down in sermon form for me, for you, just journal it. When did you get to know Jesus? And why is Jesus important for you? What difference has Jesus made in your life?
and and just reflect on that. And if you can write it down on paper first, then maybe you can sit down with your spouse or your child or your parent and share with them because you have it written down. It's good to know the answer to that and to be able to practice it in a safe place. For if we are indeed to unbind our faith and let our light shine, it's going to be pretty bright. And it's going to go from inside this room out those doors. But we just need to get back in shape again. May God help us to unbind our faith, and shine true light into the world. Let us pray. Lord, we do give thanks for the way that you have made such a difference in all of our lives. How the birth and life and teachings of the one who we claimed as Lord and Savior continue to live within us and lead us from dark places into the light of life. Help us, Lord, to not fear, to fear not. You are always telling us that that you will give us the words and the actions that will help lead others into your presence. We pray all this in the name of the one who has made such a difference in our lives, Jesus the Christ. Amen.